We're back here at West China Tea. We are going to be talking to a representative from 10th Mountain. Christopher Rice is uh, here today. We've got Sohan with the tea and welcome back. Uh, let's, what kind of tea do you think we're going to try today? We're doing a bourbon first, we ascertained. Yes, okay, we are. So I'm going to do a red tea. I'll go ahead and get this one started so we can get a taste of it and then we can cool. do the whiskey. I'm using my little tube today because I, this is what I do when I'm too lazy to scoop tea out of a bag is I'll go get one of these tubes and I'll take one of these little coins off. This is tea. I, thought I was, this I was, is tea. I walked in and I was like, this has to be tea. I was not certain, but it was, it was a catch. It's tea mm -hmm. and then it's like a miniature version of like these guys. This is originally, this is how okay. it would have been pressed in a big cake like this and traded for horses. So that's where we get aged tea from. Uh -huh. Any tea that you see pressed is a tea that will probably do well aged. Um, this one's a little okay. convenient miniature one that we put in these little tubes and it's called Gamma Ray. It's a purple red tea. Tea, and so like, you said you've never done this before. Yeah. I don't know, everyone's got different starting points. So like starting at the very, very most basic thing, tea is the name of a plant. When we say tea, we mean the tea plant, Camellia yeah. sinensis. Not like ginger or hibiscus or something like that, mm -hmm. or like mate or rooibos, but just the tea plant. It's it originates in China. There's six types of tea. Okay. Just like there's red wine and there's white wine. There's, mm -hmm. there's six types of tea. There's green tea, there's black tea, which we call red tea. This is what we'd call black tea in America. Okay. We call it red tea in Chinese. So okay. it's fully oxidized. Green tea's unoxidized. Red tea's fully oxidized. oxidized. Okay. Right? So that's where we're starting. That's really, really cool. fascinating. And what are the little symbols on the package? Does that tell you what you're looking at? Yes, or? this is, they're color coded. So we've got a little legend that goes along with this. So you can see this one's, I don't know if you can see it or not. It's pretty little, but uh, it's got a red field, and then it's <laughs> holding up this like busted <laughs> wrapper. <laughs> it's got a, a red field, so that means it's a red tea. And the reason it's got a purple bat and a purple ring, it's not uh -huh. a mustache. People think it's a mustache. It, it is looks a bat. like a mustache. It does look <laughs> like a mustache, but it also looks like a bat flying downwards, and that's what it is. But <laughs> it, because because it's from the Ziya wild purple, naturally occurring purple tea plant. Most okay. tea plants are green. Yeah. That's what we expect a tea plant to look like, or just most plants in general. Sometimes they're purple. It's a genetic um, mutation or mm -hmm. something like that. Maybe Very an epigenetic easy. switch that gets turned on. There's all, there could be a, lots of different things, you know what I mean, genetically. But sometimes tea plants are purple. And if you pick the ones that just happen to be purple, then you get zia cha, which okay. is what this is. And it's been processed as a red tea. Okay. So purple is not one of these six types of tea. Okay. It's just a phenotype. It's just the color of the plant. Gotcha. The living plant is that color. And when it has particular characteristics to it, it's different um, for that. You know, okay. you can think of like using a different grain, you know, using making yeah. whiskey with a different uh, mash bill or, mm -hmm. or something like that. The starting material is fundamentally different. The process is the same. Yeah. You know, the process you're doing to it will be the same as any other red tea. And then like every one of these little red ones in here is a red tea. You know, the, the green ones are Sheng Puar, the white ones are white tea, the black ones are Shu Puar, and all the red ones are red tea. And so there's different permutations okay. of the way of the starting material of the plant, all processed in exactly, pretty much exactly the same way. Okay, cool. And they're separated by the way that they're color coded on the front. That's awesome. Know, the way the wrapper is, yeah. So that's what we're doing. Uh, and I'm gonna go ahead and make it in this teapot. This is a dedicated teapot. I only make red tea in this because it's uh, unglazed and absorbs the flavor of the tea. And we did a, a silver needle tea one time, so that would be, uh, would have that silver color on the tea. Hmm, well, hmm, yeah. The silver needle tea that silver we did. Silver needle, yeah. Yeah, so that's as a silver cast to it, like the purple. Oh, um, we did, we did, when we did Purple Moonlight, that was a white tea mm -hmm. and it had a purple cast to it. This is not going to look purple, it's going to look red, red. Yeah. because the process has run over the color of the plant. But there's types of tea where it's processed as green tea or processed as white tea where the purple color does come out and I actually see it in the liquid. Cool. Yeah. But I'll go ahead and you can check this out. It's just a neat little object. That's just a bunch of leaves. You can smell it. It's not going to have much smell until I warm it up. That's cool. But it's just a bunch of leaves pressed together. When we're done, it's just going to look like leaves. It won't look like it was ever pressed into a so shape. A coin of some sort. Yeah, like, it's like a coin, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, should I show the camera? Can the camera see this? Yeah. Hey, Corey with the skills. Corey's time is very expensive, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> but you're paying it well with the yeah, camera. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. 
So I'll give it a little shake, warm it up. I haven't, I haven't rinsed it yet. I'm just going to warm it up. To get these to open up, you have to rinse them once. You, you, you hit them with hot water so they can open up. Go ahead and give that a smell now that it's in this warmed vessel. Oh, wow. That just awakened so much yeah, already. Yeah. 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 Oh, yes. It was fairly dormant. Yeah. Yeah. And that's yeah. just the heat of the pot. Mm -hmm. We were talking earlier before we started filming, we were talking about, I was like smelling it and Corey's made some joke about putting my hand on it because when I'm feeling the temperature yeah. of the tea, of the water to use for the tea, that's how I do it is I'll smell and I'll feel the temperature of the water and that's how I'll know what the right temperature is. But um, uh, I, I didn't know what he was talking about. I, was ta I thought he was talking about putting his hand and then we we're talking about yeah. uh, putting whiskey on your hand to smell it, like rub it in your hands to get the, the fragrance. Yep. You know, yeah, which is, which is cool, but I was like, I can't do that in poor tea because I will, it's just like, I'm like blind if I can't smell. And I, yeah. every time I drink the tea, I'm smelling whiskey in my hands. It's like, it doesn't work. But, <laughs> but that's kind of a cool way of doing that is like warming it up, you know, just the same thing actually. It's like yeah. you're warming, in both cases, you're warming it up. So this is the, the rinse. We're gonna just pour this one out. And all. It's such a fascinating process to watch, and I love it. And it, it's such an art form, which has been cool to see. You know, watching these episodes in the past and seeing you do this in the past that way is just—it's really fun to see from my perspective of being an office in the tea world and and ha seeing how you go through it. And it really is just you're walking through an art form, like you're creating a a, a sculpture or a painting um, through through senses, and it's it's really just a blast to watch. Thank you. I'm glad you get to be here for it. It's way yeah. better when you can drink the tea. Go ahead and um, pour that on this fish here. Okay. This is your tea pet for today. That's one of my tea oldest tea pet. pets. I've had that guy for a long time. Yeah. Sometimes we pour out tea. The first steeping of tea, we pour it out. And when we pour it out, we pour it on a little statue. You don't have to, but you can. It is optional to pour it on a little, little dude. And they get dark the more tea you pour on them. So you can watch as they change color very slowly over time. Like this fish, you didn't used to be able to see his scales. I guess really? I should hold him up. Let me see if I... That's wild. Yeah. yeah. I was curious about those. I was actually going to ask, like, the, the purpose of the, the tea pets, now that I know their name. Just for fun. Just for fun? Yeah, just I for love fun. it. Yeah. They don't serve... Uh, they, people say, so it doesn't splatter when you pour. Uh-huh. And... I heard the first time I heard that I was like, okay, whatever. You just want a cute little thing, and yeah. you don't want you either think of an excuse to like pour stuff on this cute little thing. Um, but uh, then people have independently. I've been serving tea to people, and I had like a Tesla engineer be like, but I was like, they serve no purpose. This is what I said. I was like, they're yeah. just there to be cute. They're been there to be fun. They show you how long you've been drinking tea for. It's like part of just like the teapots. The teapots also age and change color, and they yeah. get a patina on them. So they get a patina. It's part of this. Uh, aspect of Chinese tea culture of things getting better with age, tea yeah. getting better with age, the the uh, the tea wear getting better with age, the server getting better with experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know? uh, and and uh, but I so I was like, yeah, just that. And he was like, but you know, they do would prevent it from splattering. Like I guess people do think of that. I was I wouldn't be the one to think yeah. of that. I would just pour you know pour it wherever. But used to have people pouring tea on rocks and stuff like that. Uh -huh. You know. Yeah. You can still do that. You can have a, a, <laughs> a pet rock, pet tea pet rock. Yeah. It's fun because it's like it makes a pet rock actually do something, you know. Yeah, right. The pet rock just sits there. He does more than weigh down paper. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'll do one more smell of this now that it's been actually fully woken up. A lot of times, also, you know, when you're a chef or if you're a, a bartender or a, a craftsperson, your your tools are important and yeah. they become part of you. You want to know where your tools are and how to use your tools mm -hmm. and other people's tools don't seem quite right and, yeah. and you're not making the same type of product. So I can understand that in terms of the craft of making tea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Knowing where your tools are and what tools you're using. You get very attached to your tools. I'm sure in whiskey making, you get very attached to your tools, whatever it is that you're, you're working with. That's your, your craft is you're seated in those objects. Oh, for sure. So tell me a little bit about your role at 10th Mountain. So I am just, I'm the regional sales manager for, I'm, I manage something like uh, seven states right now, oh, which wow. is a lot. It's, it's a lot. Um, yeah. so I, <laughs> I'm very sleepy. I concur. <laughs> yes. And one of them is Texas, and I, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm a Texas boy. All right. Um, uh, it's, I, I got started with them uh, March this year so that was really exciting and that was my first foray, foray into the the whiskey world professionally okay i um, been a big fan of whiskey you know with 
uh, Modern Rogue, uh, with you know Whiskey Vault. Those guys really got me into it. Actually, my wife and I came down to uh, Fang and Feather for our um, oh, yeah. our mini moon, and we met Richard. And that was just oh, that's how you, really is that cool. you know Richard. Uh, is that how you know? That's how that's I met him. Yeah, yeah. and okay, then I cool. saw him at, uh, at Texas Whiskey Fest, and I was like, uh, "Dude, you don't remember me?" But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was it was really cool, you know. Um, and we we stepped into this world of, of whiskey and really diving in. Like one of our favorite things to do is my wife and I will go pick whiskeys off our shelf and just blind taste each other, mm. and then you know get down to talking about flavoring grains and um, figuring out proof points and things like that. So. Um, I got pretty good at that for a while. I'm not great at like. There's some guys out there that can nail it down to the producer and stuff like that. But right. like, I have a de- I say I think I have a pretty decent palate and can um, taste and smell things well. Um, mm-hmm. But I'm also I get really excited and start talking about weird things. Like one time I said I smelled Italian parsley, like specifically Italian parsley. Right. It's just because I cook with it more. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's not really any different than curly parsley in my opinion. But I mean. I would say that they're different enough, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I've smelled both of those things. I feel like they're 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 ever so slightly different. Yeah, I, I think that there's, you know, that we, we 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 have that in common. Obviously, in tea and whiskey, mm-hmm. we're smelling and tasting, yeah. and focusing a lot on that. For sure. And there's the I think the they there and that, then there's this more kind of uh, like s- subtle component, mm-hmm. you know, the the set setting, the people, the place, yeah, and. And something else, like the relationship between the person and doing between the whiskey and the whiskey. For sure. But in Chinese tea culture, the the uh, the the how prominent those are is inside out, right? Yeah. In the West, we're those things are cool. Those things are why people love things. That's why yeah. people really love things. But what gets talked about is the smell and the taste. Yes. You know, like the world of like a sommelier or something like that. It's mm-hmm. gonna be all about the smell and the taste. Right. And they talk about that in China, but that's kind of the smaller part of the picture. The bigger part of the picture is, as we talk about all the time on the show, the chi of the tea, the way it makes yeah. you feel, that there's an equality yeah. of feeling inherent to the tea that is not just caffeine. Mm-hmm. It's not just milligrams of caffeine. It's yeah. the personality of the tea. And definitely the same can be said for whiskeys, 100%, oh, yeah. you know, and there's the personality totally. of the barrel, the personality of the grain, you know, the personality of the person making it. Yeah. And those come through. They're just not, I just, I don't, we, we discuss them on the show because yeah. I always bring right. it up, right? Right, right. <laughs> because yeah. that's the part that interests me, you know, about whiskey oh, 100%. and anything. But, but um, so like a feeling like Italian parsley is like the uh, organoleptic instrument of your nose, like on yeah. point, or is there something that is meaningful on an emotional level or a psychological yeah. level? Like you cook with it a lot, so like yeah. feelings of home, feelings of like comfort, feelings of nourishment, yeah. whatever. Mm-hmm. So like in tea culture, we're here we, that we're really first we're, you know, at least around here, we're here for that kind of yes. that connective part. Like yes. What is it connecting you to on this like deeper level? Totally. And the the the, the skill set of tasting and smelling yes. is cool, but it's not primary. It's not yeah. the primary thing that that people do really in China, in Chinese tea culture. Yeah. And it's different than coffee and whiskey and beer, mm-hmm. et cetera, because those are all seated in the and West. Flavor. For me it's yeah, more about a story and who the people are, what is it that they're doing. Like the craft. The craft. What differentiates you 10th Mountain from another distillery down the road. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and 10th Mountain is in Colorado. Colorado, yep, we're, we're based in Vail. Our distillery is actually in Gypsum, about 25 miles outside of Vail. Uh, we actually just had our 10 year anniversary, which was really fun, it was up there about two weeks ago. So got to, got to visit and uh, my wife got to come up see the distillery and it was, it was so much That's fun. That's cool. And plus it's this time of year, Vail is gorgeous. Mm-hmm. I'm uh, I'm from Texas and I want to not be cold. So like, winter's where, cool. Where, where are you from? Uh, Tyler, Texas. Oh, okay, yeah, cool. So. Yeah, I'm from Houston. Oh, sweet. Yeah, yeah. 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 Richard's from Canada. <laughs> <laughs> well, I actually yeah. grew up in the Upper Peninsula in Michigan, but I've I was born in Texas and then my parents moved up north. So I ran away from the cold as soon as I was 18. <laughs> as soon right. as I could move out, I was like, let's get south. Mm. That was my wife's intention was to get away from mm-hmm. the the long winters, long cold winters. Yep. And uh, so the first place we went to was uh, Florida. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So we were down in Sarasota. Overcompensating. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Sarasota on the beach. She's Sarasota. working night shifts and she would come home at like seven, eight o'clock in the morning and go out and sleep in the sun. 
<laughs> just, <laughs> just soaking it up, recharging your battery. Really? Yeah, I, I think that there was something missing. It's like years of growing up in and it being cold and yeah. winter and wet dark. in Nova Scotia and dark. Oh, yeah, yeah, seasonal depression. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, 100%. Like I don't that. know about that because I don't. I don't live there. I've never yeah. lived there. Yeah, like I'm the same. I've, I've never lived some. I've never spent the whole winter and a whole year mm -hmm. somewhere where it snows in the winter. I've yeah. been in the snow. Yeah, I've been in the snow many times. Oh yeah, but I have never spent the whole year somewhere where it snows in the winter. Putting your boot into a slushy mm. puddle and having it go into your sock that sounds and into terrible. your boot. That's Sounds yeah. Awful. That's that's one of the worst feelings. That's yeah, terrible. That's terrible. Yeah. <laughs> so tenth mountain. Yes. In Vail, Colorado. Yes. You've got. It looks like a soldier on your shirt. Yes. Yeah, so this is actually the Walking Man, which is the symbol of the tenth mountain division. So tenth mountain whiskey and spirit company was founded because the tenth mountain division, which is to this day the most actively deployed division in the military, oh. they're. They have been a part of things from World War II when they were founded um, with things like Mogadishu with Black, Black Hawk Down. Mm -hmm. um, they were the ones sent in to recover. Uh, and then still to this day with Afghanistan and um, Iraq and all those conflicts. Um, but they, they were formed in Camp Hale outside of Vail, Colorado. It's about, I don't know, about 15 miles outside of Vail, 15, 18 miles. And they created this camp and they recruited skiers, mountaineers, um, marksmen, things like that of the outdoor nature and sent them up to Camp Hill. It sits in a valley at 9,200 feet above sea level and then trained them for mountaineering warfare um, and warfare tactics, things like that in the early 40s. Uh, and then they were sent to the Apennine Mountains over in Italy, um, sent to cross what was called the Gothic Line. I don't know if you've ever heard of that or heard that expression talked about um, that the Axis had. And it was thought to be this impenetrable line across. Like it was, they were so hunkered down in these mountains that um, they didn't think anyone could get through. Um, after, of course, these guys were sent there with, you know, rucksacks in their back and they were the first people to ever cross this Gothic line. Um, and it was actually one of the things that led to the downfall of Hitler, which is Pretty cool. So these guys have done some great things. Um, they were actually, from getting across there, they were next scheduled um, to to go to uh, Japan, but Japan surrendered um, due to unfortunate things. But so high high altitude training, they do yes. that with um, with athletes as well to, yes. to build up their stamina. And yep. so that's that's really interesting that uh, they would do that also with the military to get them acclimated from one mountain range to another mountain yes. range. Yes, it's it's really it's it's wild that they do that because I mean if they train at those kind of altitudes and they, I mean I was just I was just up there a couple of weeks ago like I said walking up stairs was a challenge for me. I'm a flatlander, you know, mm -hmm. right, <laughs> live in the right, piney right, woods. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was just, you would see me uh, walking up to a tee box. I played a bunch of golf when I was up there and I'd get to the top of that tee box and I'd be going, <laughs> and so wow. like 5,000 feet above sea That's level. Just, and these guys are carrying 80 pounds on their back. That's cool. So the distillation in that kind of altitude, it's actually your boiling point is going to be at a different, different. range. Yep. Oh, shit. It's slightly, slightly different. Um, it actually, it even affects the aging. Um, it's wild because it's, it's where gypsum is, where our distillery is, is basically a high desert. Um, so there's a lot of similarities. Uh, and kind of what made me enjoy 10th Mountain Whiskey was it reminded me a bit of um, Texas whiskeys, which are which have been my love because they're real funky. They get weird mm -hmm. because there's a lot of barrel impact. And, you know, right. we use 53 gallon barrels up there, but we're still getting a ton of barrel impact because in gypsum, it'll be summertime. It'll get up upwards of 100. And then all of a sudden you'll have a few evenings that it drops down to the 50s. So you're <laughs> don't, don't do that here. Don't yeah. do that around yeah, here. Just, yeah. We just, just goes the into the barrel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we're starting off with some bourbon. Bourbon, yes. So, so it's fun. Beef. This is a 75% blue corn we get from Cortez, Colorado. 21% uh, rye. We try and get all of our grains from Colorado if we can. Um, we get it from Fort Collins, one available. If not, we get it from the Dakotas, very similar climate. All our barley does come from Sheboygan, though. No. So, 
I like it. Yeah, which is fun to say. Yeah, it's a great <laughs> word. Try the uh, try the tea real quick and just tell me what. Give me give me whatever whatever you get from the experience of just tasting that before we drink the whiskey. And I've got a strong one here to pair with the whiskey, which is how we do. So blue corn. You know my favorite corn chips are blue corn chips. Uh, me too. They're just, it's kind of like better. the sweetness, in my opinion. And the texture's better. Yes, yeah. totally agree. And I mean, if it's blue, there's something in it making there's it blue. Something. And I don't see that much blue stuff. That's so. what I'm saying. Yes. What is it? What is that blue thing? I really, All right. there's yeah. like a natural sweetness to this mm -hmm. tea, which is, is so cool. And I can tell it comes from the process of making it, um, like you, uh, steeping the tea now and it's it's so cool to go on that adventure especially the first pour of tea versus mm -hmm. this pour mm -hmm. like they're just some of the astringencies from from the tea itself started to come out mm -hmm. in that second pour and that was really fascinating but there's like like a citrusy vanilla to this and I'm, I'm really just that's fascinating that's not what I expected from and the color you can see it's just starting to open up now we're getting to the point where it's not a coin anymore now mm -hmm. it's just yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. like magic yeah, that's really cool. Wait, wait, oh. show it to me again. Oh, wait. Hold. <laughs> Got it? Yeah. All right. Yeah, that looks cool. All right. Mm. All Going right. back so, and forth. Blue corn from Sheboygan. Uh, the, the blue corn comes from Colorado. Oh. The, the barley, all the barley's our barley. from Sheboygan. Okay. Barley's from Sheboygan. It's the only- Colorado blue corn. Yep. And I've, I've seen Sheboygan that. barley. I've seen yeah. that at a couple other distilleries where they, there are certain things that they like grown locally and it was generally the corn that they the liked corn. grown yep. uh, locally. Oh, yeah. But things like barley, oh, yeah. they're getting from further afield. Knowing what the grains are really enhances my enjoyment of whiskey. Like thinking about the grains, mm -hmm. like thinking about that blue corn when I drink this really enhances my enjoyment yep. of, of it. I'm, I'm such a fan of blue corn. Just to me, it brings almost the corn sweetness is not that white corn sweetness. It's more of a like kettle corn almost. Mm -hmm. Like there's a savory quality. And this is 92 proof, um, which is our standard. So it's, you know, it's not proof of the floor, but it still has some character. Oh, there's nuttiness now that's coming. That's really pleasant. Yeah. Yeah. It's very, it's very, <laughs> um, it's, 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 it's also interesting. It's nice drinking not uh, cask strength. Yeah. Whiskey, first, <laughs> like first, first, first thing. Yeah, first, first thing, first thing yeah. on the show. Um, uh, yeah, for once. <laughs> We're yeah. always drinking cask strength, with, which is great. I love cask strength. This is really nice. It's also nice to have something that has been given some kind of human attention towards like yes. the level of alcohol that's in it for mm -hmm. the purpose of making it balanced. Because, mm -hmm. you know, I'll add water. I'll get a cask strength with the whiskey and I'll add a little bit of water. But it's nice when someone who really knows the whiskey also does that. I, yeah. you know. mm -hmm. And it's interesting, American whiskeys tend to be in the 40 to 50%, 46 to 50% range mm -hmm. as, as standard. It's not as normal unless you're getting a mixing yes. whiskey that goes Ooh. down to the 40%. All right, it's a good pairing. It's yeah. good, yeah, it's good. You yeah, can't, you, red tea, you can't go wrong with whiskey and red tea, generally speaking. I was just. I was thinking the Probably same thing. I took a sip right after I yep. tasted my whiskey and I was just like, wow, yeah, that's good. that is a, a, just a, the compliments yeah. there. Like there's things that give you like a little bit of a juxtaposition, yeah. but this is like two things that just marry. Exactly. marry yeah, this. they're not the same and they're no. not juxt they're not opposites either. Yes. People are always like, oh, smoked tea, pair it with a PD, you know, like mm -hmm. a Isla, you know, you know, PD whiskey. Right. It's like, well, no, because that's, it's, it's redundant. You know, what, what yeah. complements it, what goes well with it. And I think that, uh, red tea, you know, it has like the color is, you know, there's whiskeys that look like that. You know, yeah. there's the color and there's the, there's definitely certain similarities. Mm -hmm. There's tannic notes, mm -hmm. you know, so those are, those are harmonious. But then you get it. I feel like there's these fruity notes in red tea, especially like this is a sun-dried red tea. So mm -hmm. it doesn't get baked. It doesn't get roasted. Okay. It's mm -hmm. just sun-dried. It's been massaged and it's been sent yeah. to oxidize it. And then it's been sun-dried. It's a very like, um, yeah rootsy kind of rustic way of processing yeah. tea like like with barrels whenever they're either sun drying barrels or if they're using a kiln to dry mm. their barrels things like that i didn't even think about that yeah so that's that's a really yo cool. yo that's why tea and whiskey work like that because you got even like down to stuff like sun drying things i never thought nor that i guess you probably just sun dry grains or kiln dry grains too mm -hmm. or, i'm getting i'm getting the dry dusty corn but i'm getting a sweet vanilla pastry in there too yeah 
when I do them together, here, when I do them separately, here's what I get. So I get, I, I, like you were saying, there's uh -huh. like a vanilla citrusy thing in the tea, there's like a berry thing in the tea mm -hmm. that I get from those purple teas a lot. Um, but this, I just think about that blue corn. I just love that it was just the idea of the blue corn mm -hmm. when I smell it and taste it and being like, this comes from blue corn. This blue corn turned into this. Yeah. And a lot of blue corn turned into a little bit of this. That's mm -hmm. something I like to think about is that you had to use a whole ton a whole of grain ton of it. Yeah. and concentrate its essence down into this little volatile liquid. And you said 70% was blue corn. So 75, yeah. 75% yeah. blue corn and then 21 rye. And I, the rye green, I think, is what's standing really out to good. me. Mm -hmm. It's really, it's very clean tasting. I think mm -hmm. that's what jumps out. I get caramel notes. Um, I get the wood, but not even necessarily like just oak, not just like a, yeah. just like oaky, 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 but like uh, some kind of wood, almost like getting into like cedar or like old mm -hmm. wood. Yes. Like an old, like that's a tea note that I use a lot is old piano. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Old oh, library, yeah, piano, like library. Varnishing. Yeah, like, I say yeah. that for tea a lot because there's a lot of aged teas and the tea mm -hmm. aged teas are fermenting. And the way they're fermenting is the way a book in a library is fermenting. Yeah. You know, it's decomposing, it's turning into, into soil. Can you show me the bottle? Yes, I can. He's Actually, just going to hit it. <laughs> I'm getting. He's going to start sipping off of it. I think that's that nuttiness that I'm getting yeah. is that, that woody, <laughs> nutty. I think that's where, that, where that's coming from. Yeah. I'm. It's like pecan shells. Yes. Oh yeah, that's good. Yeah. That's good. That's a good one. Right yeah. Now. Yeah. Cheers. You know, it's, it's funny you talk about that note. We talked about, you know, tasting and the experience of tasting and what that looks like. My wife, like we're talking about the feeling of, of whiskey and the memories it brings up. And I've, I've had quite a few. There's certain whiskeys that trigger that in me. Uh -huh. And I think it was a, it was a Riverset Rye Texas Select. Um, Ooh, that's so good. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. my, my wife, was talking about and she was saying you know this reminds me of sitting on my on my grandmother's porch mm -hmm. cracking pecan shells open with a hammer oh, okay like, and i i love that i love that visual and i think i think tea does that i think whiskey does that is when yeah. you can open up that experience of of a memory from your past it's just something fun and wild and different those those are the notes that i am here for you know what i mean like in, in, in this in this place in this practice in in my personal practice uh, and my role when I teach, I teach classes about this That's and my really role cool. as a teacher, like those are the notes that Noted. I'm here for because that for me is like, that's where the pathos comes from. That's like what drives mm -hmm. the, the feelings of deep satisfaction that we get from this beyond just taste and smell because, yeah. you know, that's when people get into like, really get into age statements, you know what I mean? Right. Where they really, you know, there's ancient tree tea, there's, there's aged tea, but there's also tea from old trees. Yeah. And people will chase after these old trees, they call oh, this tree's more than a thousand years old. And it's like, you know, seeking, what are you, you're trying to get the most value from this attribute, but that's not yes. really how it is. That's not really how it works. It's this holistic thing. Yeah. And I think that, 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 that value mining, you know, mining mm -hmm. for value in the attributes of the thing mm -hmm. is for me, feels very flat compared to just being able to, Experience. maybe you're drinking some kind of bullshit whiskey, but yeah. it's a really good night. You know what right. I mean? Yeah. Like 100%. you're having a really special memory. Um, and you know, what's more precious, like that, a glass of that whiskey or a glass of some very, very fancy whiskey oh, where yeah. you didn't enjoy it because you weren't in a good mood and you weren't with people you wanted to be with, yep. you know, et cetera. So I think that, you know, realizing that value is ultimately subjective and yes. leaning into that. I really yeah. appreciate that. That's what I love about this show is that, right. um, you know, we get the opportunity because everyone has that relationship. Everyone yes. who sits in that chair, you know what I mean? And mm -hmm. comes on this show yeah. has that relationship with whiskey. Oh, 100%. Uh, it's just, it, again, it's just not part of the narrative the same way. Mm -hmm. um, or maybe it is and I don't, I miss it. But when I go in that space, if I go on, you know, Reddit or whatever, I go in that space, right. I see a lot of, very scientific, you know, very yes. scientific approach to things, which yes. I appreciate. Like yes. my background's in science, I appreciate that aspect. Mm -hmm. But uh, but yeah, it definitely seems very seated in that a very sensory experience. That's the the payoff is in the sensory experience. Yeah, I'm, I'm of, the, of the same opinion. The best whiskey that you're going to find is the whiskey that you're drinking with yep. friends and with community. The person who is collecting the the whiskey to to show it off on a shelf. Um, or to invest in the future mm -hmm. and maybe it's something that they that they give away uh, as a heirloom to their family because it might be worth mm -hmm. something at some time there I don't believe they're sitting there and enjoying it Agreed. half as much now I do know some people when they're collecting it's one for one for me and one for later or one for mm -hmm. now or one for for the shelf 
Um, yeah. The Rothschilds, actually, I can't remember which Rothschild family it was. It's like, we're, we're not making it to, to collect, we're making it to be drunk. Mm -hmm. We're making it for you to share. Yes. And um, there, I've heard that a lot in the whiskey community and, and finding that time where, you know, uh, there's, there's a, apparently a story of a kid going to uh, a distillery and all of these rare bottles were on the shelf. Mm -hmm. And it's like, those are the ones that you collect, Dad. And uh, the, the presenter is sitting there going, you know, they're not there just to look at on a shelf. They're there to share, and he went through this whole story of sharing the whiskey, okay. and it gave that person a time to finally come, come and have an occasion with their family, as opposed to it sitting on the shelf waiting for someday, mm -hmm. all of this will be yours. Yep. <laughs> right, 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 yeah. And I love that. I, I, I'm of that mindset, too. I mean, we have more bottles than necessary. Uh -huh should be in one home at our house. But uh, my favorite thing is when people that are, are new to whiskey and things like that, and they walk in like, oh, this is so cool. I'm like, cool, what do you want to try? Like, that's why, I didn't, I didn't buy these bottles just to sit here and look at them and let them collect dust. Um, but I want to share, I want to know what your opinion of this thing is. And oh yeah. Take away, yeah. take away my impression of dollar amount spent or a story of that whiskey. And I want to hear what you feel like you're saying with, with this bottle, like this is, is this yeah. cool to you? And then I can talk about, oh, this is why this is finished in prisoner barrels. Like the the Bardstown Prisoner series was one of my favorites. That one's a very emotional attachment. That was the whiskey I bought on my wife and I's wedding day, uh -huh. and we shared that. And uh, so, what is it? a prisoner barrel? So the prisoner wine. Have you heard uh, of them? Okay. Yes. And they, Bardstown has their collaboration series, and they collaborated with the prisoner uh, and did two di two different batches. And I had got my hands on batch two and it was just a really fun, really fruity, very wine forward mm -hmm. um, with almost like a peanut shell kind of middle wow. of the palate. It was, it's a really cool adventure. Some people liked it. Some people loved it. Some people were like, this ain't for me. Right. But um, that to me holds so much memory and I can still remember waking up the day of her wedding uh, and being like, we got to get a bottle of whiskey for our wedding day. You know, that's been such part of our story. And we live in Tyler, which is dry. Mm -hmm. So I have to drive to the county line to get to get whiskey. And I call, I was like, I'm gonna go to this other store that typically has more rare things. Um, and I call them and I was like, do you guys have the Bardstown Discovery Series? She's like, no. I did this Bardstown Prisoner though, and I knew what it was. And I was like, can you hold it? I'll be there in 40 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. I had uh, the Bardstown uh, Foursquare Rum mm -hmm. uh, finish. And uh, that was one that, um, again, somebody that we met socially, he, he owns a coffee shop in the, in the hill country, and he found out that I love rum and I love Foursquare and what they're doing, mm -hmm. and he had half a bottle and he gave it to a friend of a friend so that I would be able to, t to, to try it. That's so, so cool. Yeah. I love that. Um, that's, I, that's what I think whiskey does, is it brings people together, it brings, you know, just so much generosity. I, a local brewery I, I worked for part-time up in Tyler um, after I left there they asked Jenny and I to come out and do a class on just like walking people through a blind tasting uh -huh. and taking away the you know how blind tastings take away your impression of like cost or a label you recognize or things like that so I did a fun little lineup of um, uh, Bardstown the fusion series and I did true blue from Balcones uh, and then I did um, what was it uh, I want to say it was wild turkey 101. No, it wasn't. It was Larceny. Larceny. Regular Larceny. So they had a weeded whiskey and, uh, you know, a higher rye whiskey and a blend um, and then a corn whiskey. Right. So we got to go through the adventure of what these are and then people taking away their perspective of some people weren't whiskey drinkers. They're like, oh, this is a different experience. Like, I've never had <laughs> so whiskey. a lot of whiskey to drink if you don't like whiskey. <laughs> yeah, it is. Mm. Uh, and then so many of them are like, wow, I've never really enjoyed whiskey. And this is so such a different experience. And then the experience is now what they think of when they think of whiskey instead of that time when I drank too much Jack Daniels in college and got sick. Oh, but, yeah. Southern Comfort. So, 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 so,
discomfort. <laughs> Southern discomfort is right. Discomfort. It'd be right really to cool to do a flight of just a blue corn bourbons and do a flight of uh, or blue corn whiskeys. Mm -hmm. That would be really cool. Um, red First, corns, corn. like we were. We, yeah, we the, had some red the, corn. The, yeah, yeah, from yeah. Still Austin. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, Jimmy Red Corn. There's a, there's yeah. a few out there that are all red corn. Yep. That would be really cool to do a uh, tasting and, and contrast and compare what you're getting just from that varietal grain would be interesting to try. Yeah, it's, I, I think uh, there's something to blue corn uh, that I just really enjoy. I think it's just a, it's a different perspective on grains. There's so many white corn, so much white corn out there, you know, mm -hmm. that's being used. Um, but I really enjoy it. And there's some people that do white corn really, really well. MB Roland being one of them, they use all white corn from their area of Kentucky. Uh, and he does a, if you haven't had it, the dark fire corn. Um, and it's the same process they use for dark fire cured tobacco that they do in that area. Okay. And he does, it's a cold smoke and smokes the corn for like a week. It's really fascinating. Yeah, Iron Root was playing with some black corn they were growing on the side of their distillery. Cool. So I don't know oh, if that's going to end up black corn. black corn. They got all kinds of corn. Yeah, that's know? wild. They got all kinds of corn. Halloween's coming up, so they were calling it on the internet corn on macabre. <laughs> hey, what's, what's, is, is, is scotch oh gosh, always barley? That's amazing. Is that? scotch always barley? What's scotch? Scotch is going scotch? to, if it's a single malt, it's 100% barley. Mm -hmm. If it's a blended malt, it could have other grains. Uh, usually the lowlands are going to be using, they call it maize. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's just corn. 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 Uh, but yeah, they, you're using predominantly corn and uh, rye and, and barley in those, in, those, uh, in those column stills because it's a little bit, you get a little bit more sugar, a little more for um, alcohol out of the God, final product sure. on those column stills, yeah. Yeah. But America is where corn is from. Mm -hmm. North yes. America yes. is where mm -hmm. corn is yes. from. So we really kind of have dibs on like running the corn game because mm -hmm. all the heirloom cultivars, bridles and stuff are going to be right. here. Mm -hmm. And yep. this is where they're from. So, I mean, honestly, I, I'm looking forward to seeing more corn game you know, mm -hmm. in, in, mm -hmm. a, in American whiskey. I've, now that I've experienced a little bit, because you're talking about white corn, red yeah. corn, blue corn, black corn. And like, you got those crazy rainbow corns. Yeah. Like, I don't even know about all the corns. There's yeah. so many corns, but but um, I, I do I do taste it. You know, I do taste the mm -hmm. blue corn. I mean, I honestly, you can't tell me that I don't, because I've had a couple of blue corn whiskeys on this show. Right. And I always like them. I yeah. always I always like them. And uh, I couldn't say exactly what it is about it that I like, but it's that blue corn vibe. Mm -hmm. you know, I agree. I get from that. So I'm Same with rye. I don't even know what, <laughs> what does rye taste like. You know, mm -hmm. I guess people say it tastes yeah. spicy or whatever. I don't think of a particular taste when I think of rye. I just know that my, I like rye. I like the way right. that it you know, tastes. Most people, their reference is going to be rye bread and having, you know, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's, that's going to be something that they're going to be used to, with, especially with, uh, with sandwiches. I just remember hearing American uh, American Pie and being like, "What is? What do they mean, whiskey and rye? What did they drink in grains?" <laughs> yeah. Like, I just imagine like, what does it mean to drink rye? rye. Yeah. And then I had, I think that's where this whole thought process came from. Like, whiskey is grain. The mm -hmm. grain rye is the drink. And like, like yeah, that's oh, yeah. I, and I was like, that sounds good. Why don't they have that anymore? Because that's back before you ever saw it. Oh yeah. You know, it this is like when I was a kid, anymore. like the '80s and '90s, mm -hmm. and like hearing this song and being like, trying to figure out what rye was, yep. and being like. They used to make that and they stopped. It sounds cool. Yep. And then I guess they started, when did, when did they even come back? Well, I guess we should save for the next episode. We're, we're sure. <laughs> well, I'm done. This, the whiskey's done, the tea's done. Here's my notes for what I think the taste that comes from the two together that is not in either of the two is a like chocolate coated like plum slices. Okay. Oh, that's and I know fun. we don't have either of the things anymore. Right. And the tea is past the point where it was doing, it was peaking, mm -hmm. right? Um, but that's Ooh. what I got. It was Ooh. really, really good. It was go, really, go really good. Go back to the together. empty glass. I was about to yeah. say, like, I get it. Yeah, oh, yeah. It's a vanilla-y. I get the plum. I get the plum. I don't get as much chocolate. What I got the chocolate was when I followed the whiskey with the tea in the, in the, the, where, the where the tea erased the flavor of the whiskey, yes. where it cleansed the palate, the whiskey flavor off the palate. Mm -hmm. What was there afterwards was this, like, chocolatey, dark chocolate plum skin. Oh, okay. Really. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that was fun. Yeah. Now, like Chris, that. you were saying that you and your wife do some things on Instagram where yeah. where people can follow you and and see what it is that you're doing. It's just blind tastings. Like, what are you yeah, doing so on Instagram? It's it's called at Cats Cocktails Conversations because I love alliteration, uh, and it is just my wife and I being 
complete doofuses and just sharing our love for whiskey and cocktails. And um, we're actually, like I mentioned before, we're we're opening a bar soon in East Texas, which is exciting with with a with a partner, and that's that's really excited. It's um, it kind of is a, a dream coming true, uh, and a lot of a lot of hard work. It's gonna be some oh, long yes. nights, but very very excited about it. And to get to share that, you know, we with it, this all came about working with Tenth Mountain was because of that channel, um, and just us being goofy. Uh, hanging out, we have a we have a thing called Fast Tastings with Chris and Jenny, and I, it's a little sing song jingle at the beginning. Like it's just us acting <laughs> wild and my wife being very patient with me. So uh, if you want to be silly and goofy, come on down to West China Tea and hang out and have some tea. Um, he's being silly. And there goofy we go. Over there. <laughs> you know, go follow him and his wife. I'm no promises we're going to be silly or goofy here. We do get that way sometimes. Sometimes we do. After the, the, after the fifth whiskey today, let's see how we do. It's, right. it's so nice to have you here. Like and follow. We'll be here at West China Tea at least until the end of September. And we're hoping. Maybe till the end of November. Who freaking knows? Yeah. Uh, luckily, TechStot is giving us an extension on this space. That's why we're still here. We're supposed to be out of here September 1st. This is going to be the freeway. They're going to expand the freeway and they're going to turn this oh. building down. No more this tea house. We're going to move to East 7th Street. I was just there. It's coming along real slow. Feel that? Yep, yep, real Feel slow. Because the city, mostly because the process that you Feel go through that. with the city. Mm -hmm. um, but, oh yeah, are you actually like building a bar right now? Or so like... we, we're going into a space. Thankfully, there's some stuff we have to do for ADA. And but you don't have to do a change of use or any of that stuff. No, thankfully. God bless you. God yeah. bless you. <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. You're, you're, you're very blessed to not have to do that. Yeah, it is a huge pain in the ass. Yeah. Huge pain in the ass. So Texas anyways, hopefully Cheers. they'll keep giving us extensions until the new place is ready to open. Hopefully by December 1st, we should be definitely ready to open. Um, more than ready and knock on. Good. But, uh, and then, you know, extensions as long as we can get them. Thank you, TechStot. Hope you're watching our whiskey podcast and take pity on me. <laughs> um, <yeah. laughs> the struggle is real. Thanks yeah, for joining us. Cheers. Yeah. Cheers.